Hello. Good afternoon, Handy. Quick. This meeting is being recorded. Great. Okay. Um, on the last tech check, you can see the slide and the slide overview here. Um, I can see the slides and the you know rundown on on the left. Perfect. And I'll switch the big slideshow on uh, as soon as we kick it officially. And you can hear me all right. I can hear you. That is going well. And the first people are pouring into the meeting. I uh, hope you're all well. I hope you're all healthy wherever you are. And um, we'll start this webinar in one minute. Wonderful. We are almost already reaching the uh, maximum of participants here. Um, Andy, are you? Shall we kick it off? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Oops, one second. There we are. Okay. Um, I think Deborah is having having some health issues, so I think the introduction is down to me at the moment. I wish you all a wonderful good day, good morning, good evening, wherever you are at. Most of all, I wish you that you are healthy uh, and that your friends and family are all safe, if uh, or not affected by the terrible news from southern Turkey and northern Syria uh, last week. Um, if you um, there's anything that my colleagues, my family can do for you, um, uh, for your organization then please reach out. Uh, our thoughts are with you. We have uh, partners working in the area who we are proud and happy to support with our services. Um, and if you are working in the area or on the response in the, to the earthquake response, then please reach out. With that being said, um, one of the things that every response, including the um, earthquake response needs to do is unfortunately to budget for how we help. Um, and that is the subject of our webinar here today. Um, and a brief uh, introduction. My name is uh, Christian. Uh, I'm the founder and still the managing director of MZN. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant and former finance director of a large INGO. And uh, therefore, the subject of budgets, when it becomes geeky, uh, sort of falls to me. And I'm very pleased that I am today joined by Hande. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Hande and uh, I've been working with projects and budgets for more than 15 years now. Um, I am one of those people with a, a social studies background and who hoped uh, uh, that I would never, you know, um, get to worry about budgets and finance. But of course, you know, life works in mysterious ways, and uh, I have almost uh, more more than uh, ten years of uh, experience building budgets and uh, working with them. Um, I I hope you can hear me better now. Perfectly. Yep, there are some messages in the chat uh, saying that I am not very audible. Yep, oh, better okay. now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And then even though you, uh, you, you, as a social studies background, hoped you would never deal with budgets, here you are giving a webinar about your budgets experience. For those who don't know, Amsterdam is a social enterprise uh, here to build better NGOs. Um, we simply believe that in order to reach the SDGs and to build a better world, we need to strengthen those organizations that do that which to a large part, not exclusively so, but to a large part are NGOs. So over the last 10 years or so, we've developed services um, and priced them in a nonprofit way so that we can help NGOs. And one part that we always come across are budgets in our proposal writing and in our uh, organizational restructuring work. Now, the purpose of today's talking points is that, oh, I'm sorry, before we get started, I should, um, 
I should let you know that this webinar is recorded. The slides and the recording will be made available to you by my colleague Deborah uh, in the next 48 hours or the latest three days after this webinar. If you have an urgent budget question that you just need some help with, I would encourage you all to email us directly. We are happy to help where we can. Um, bear in mind that this is a public webinar. So in the question and answer session, please do not diver uh, divulge too much private uh, and detailed uh, information about your organization or your proposal. And finally, um, the captions should work so that this uh, webinar is uh, accessible to most, hopefully. Good. Uh, let's dive right in. Our purpose today is preparing a budget from start to finish, having a brief look at the donor requirements and how to meet them, and then really getting the value of a good budget. We've got about 13 slides to get through, not the biggest webinar, not the smallest one. Uh, it's very, it goes from the conceptual to the very, to the sort of hands-on, pragmatic, practical. Um, the idea is for Hande and me to not use more than 20 to 30 minutes max talking in the presentation, and then another 30 minutes or so on Q&A. So if you've got questions, if you want to uh, have your questions answered, please use the Q&A function of this webinar so that my colleague Deborah can later just uh, sort them and get uh, you an answer in this conversation. Should there be a detailed question that arises in your mind that you don't want to share in this webinar, again, I would invite you to reach out to us by email or via the website um, and send an email box as well um, so that we can give you the assistance that you want. Great. Um, let's kick it off. Like this chess piece shows, developing a budget is, um, how do we say this, Andy? Uh, challenging. Uh, the good days uh, can be um, difficult and worse days. The problem is that a good budget is the absolute basis, one of the two key things to get right in a proposal and also in a project management tool. The problem with a proposal budget in particular are that very often we need to start writing the budget where uh, whilst the content of the proposal is not ready on time, it's not clear yet. The actual response, what we, the direct costs, what we need to do aren't finalized yet. So if you are you, uh, you need to budget for something that you don't quite know what to budget for yet. Uh, the standard response of most uh, NGO finance professionals is then to just wait until project design or program design is finished and then develop the budget in a sort of night and fog last 12 hours before the deadline, which is always going to be suboptimal, to say the least. Very often, we, we have to budget without clear unit costs or benchmark costs within the organization. That makes it difficult. That is something that can be improved. Uh, up front before you have to uh, you have to uh, budget. If you've got questions on that, if you don't know what the unit cost of an hour of work in your organization is, if you don't know these benchmark costs that should underpin all of your budgets, please reach out. That's a key way to do a better budget. Very often we simply got the problem that team members just don't respond in time or that the organizational, in, the organizational indirect costs are not clearly identified. What does HQ cost? What does it cost for us to run a training scheme that isn't clearly connected to any one project, but still we need to pay for it somehow? And then to make matters worse, the donors don't always help us. The, the template is sometimes, well, let's use the politically correct term, suboptimal again. And in a way, I don't blame them because the template is written for the donor. There are organizations which budget directly into the template, and it's sort of unsurprising that they are then running out of um, steam here because the budget template isn't necessarily the one they need. So these are some of the challenges that I'm sure some of which you may have faced before. I hope that this webinar and the following 10 points give you a bit of a starting point and you find helpful in overcoming them. Here's one thing that will hopefully not shock you. 30% of proposals fail because of their budgets. We've done an analysis of uh, European Union, some EU member states, and USAID uh, budget um, proposal submissions between the years 2016 and 2018. And one of the major contributing points to all proposals that failed was the budget. You'd think it's simple, 
The intervention is good, the reputation is good, the consortia is good, but the budget just doesn't make any sense. And one thing I would like to share with you as sort of overall tip that was given to me in my first year as a chartered accountant was, if a person who hasn't read the words, the narrative, the program design, and only reads the, the budget, if that person has a fundamental question about the budget, then the budget already failed. So I'd like you to think of a budget more as a communication tool and less as a planning tool. The idea is that I can see the budget of something and have a pretty decent idea what this budget is supposed to do, what this budget is supposed to fund. And if you approach a budget with that sort of mindset, saying, I am communicating an intent here, I am communicating through numbers and through the narrative and the words in the budget, a program design here that doesn't answer all questions, but answers most of them, of the reader who only reads the budget, then the likelihood that your budget makes sense is a lot higher. And I would say that if you don't take anything away from this, this, uh, this uh, uh, webinar, and I hope you do take some more away from this webinar, but if you only have time for one point, this is it. Your budget is a communication attempt to a donor, to your uh, consortium members, or to anybody else internally as well. Make sure it makes sense. Good. So here's why. Believe it or not, a lot of calculations are incorrect. Or the budget exceeds the stated amount in the TRS. Or it simply doesn't include all the details and explanation that the donors ask for. Very often, budget templates are amended or not used. So the donor may want to give you the project, but they can't. They're legally obliged to not because the budget template isn't used. Or there's simply no transparency of how the unit costs have been derived. That's a common mistake as well. So if it says, for example, you know, 500,000 non-food items, well, what's in there? What is the unit cost in there? Mm -hmm. That is a question that the donor would have. And going back to the narrative uh, project design is making it very complicated. Is there a large contingency cost without any explanation? So you do just put in, there we go, 5% if something happens. You can be sure that that's going to be voted down. And if, if you want it to be held up, and if you don't want it to be a mark against you in the proposal, you better explain it. The ICR, the internal cost recovery rate is too high, or the indirect costs are simply too high, uh, or um, the human resource costs are not reflected transparent, uh, transparently. A common mistake here is to put in salaries, but not all the other costs that a human at an organization causes, training, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Well, these are some of the problems that we see with budgets. Hande, anything to add? Uh, I was just going to say that there needs also to be a balance between the uh, budget ratios, because when you are applying for a funding, uh, the majority of the funds need to be directed towards the actions, towards the needs uh, in the field, rather than the human resources or venues. Totally correct. Totally correct. Absolutely right. So let's avoid some of these. And um, Hande will take us through a few um, things that you um, that we're going through this. Although you wanted me to do the slide, didn't, didn't you, Hande? Um, you can, please go ahead. OK, well, fine. You take over the next one then. Um, first up, when we start doing a budget, I'd like you to treat it not as an addendum to the proposal, but to treat the budget development itself as a project. It's a major task. So have a meeting, if at all possible, virtually or on in the meeting with your proposal team and ask them questions about the amounts. Have there been any agreements with the donors? Is there an understanding of the size of the project? Do we agree what the budget should overall be? Does the donor immediately cap it? Or is this an open submission? Like for example, many of the response submissions that we've worked on with our partners last week are where the donor just says, give me a price for what it costs to effectively respond to the terrible tragedy that happened in northern Syria and southern Turkey. Then please study, and I mean study, not just read, study the financial requirements of the funder and ensure that you have the correct templates and the information. The good news is you can outsource it. 
But if you don't outsource this, the good news is that those financial requirements regulations don't usually change so much from proposal to proposal. So once you've understood the financial requirements of a budget, say, of the EU or of the of FCDO in the UK or USAID in the United States, then those are probably this very similar, if not the same, next time around. Do develop a project plan with a timeline. And I am at the point where I say the proposal, the budget is such an important part of any proposal. If the timeline isn't held up, then submission is halted. So this proposal development might fail because it is simply better to not submit something than submit something that is faulty. Make, make sure your timeline for proposal develop, for the budget development is, on, is in line with the rest of the bid requirements. So we need to account for the fact that the program team may need some additional time to plan the proposal. But this doesn't mean that we wait with the budget until everything is done. Build in time for the approval, very important. Um, and make sure that all relevant stakeholders are, have the information required and in the time that they are informed about what is to be submitted when. So if you, if you are dealing with a partner or if you are dealing with a other office in another country, make sure that that office uh, over the horizon, so to speak, knows by when latest they need to submit to their numbers in order for them to make the master budget. Good. These, treating it as a project in itself, as a serious matter, will improve your quality already by 20, 30%. Hande, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, to reiterate, it's uh, very important to start with the budget from day one, when you know that you are going to be submitting a proposal, because you also have a deadline to ask questions, most of the time to ask questions or ask for clarifications from the donor. So, you know, time, time is of the essence very much. Um, that is why it should be treated like a project itself. And then, you know, as we can see from the slide, we have to get the templates right because uh, we might have our own internal templates, our own Excel sheets, et cetera, but uh, we have to be submitting with the donors template if there is one. And uh, the first step is to understand how it needs to be completed, how it needs to be filled out. Um, Therefore, once we study thoroughly the donor template, we need to structure our budget uh, in line with the donor requirements and uh, have to make sure that everything is stated very clearly and a person who has no idea about our program, our project, our timeline should be able to understand what the um, time frame or the context of the uh, program is simply by looking at the budget. If there's and not we're a time still getting, We're still getting some questions asking you to speak closer to your to the microphone or something. Sorry. Okay. I hope it's better now. Got yeah. too excited and let it go. <laughs> um, unless there's a template, uh, then start as simple as possible, building your own templates, uh, preferably using Excel or Google Sheets, and uh, make sure that you put in the formulas to uh, prevent any errors of calculation. Uh, sometimes we might find it easier to use Word to you know, line our activities or line our list of expenses, but uh, one of the mistakes that should be, you know, um, prevented from doing is uh, using words as a template for uh, creating budgets. And uh, when you are designing your own template, make sure it contains uh, all the details that are uh, highlighted in the guidelines issued by the donor. And uh, that means all the uh, headings, subheadings, the ratios, all should be given in the in, in your own design of the template. Uh, one of the tips and tricks, which sometimes uh, lead to a total uh, disaster of a budget, is getting the currency right. 
uh, especially if you are working with uh, conversion, make sure to uh, go and check the uh, figures before submission and refer to the website or the source of information. Um, sometimes it's uh, Sometimes a donor might be asking for a budget in the local currency of where you will be implementing. And it can be a currency that changes on a, you know, on an hourly fashion. And uh, that would make, uh, that would be very helpful if you uh, update all your budget related information before submission in line with the latest currency rate. Yes, and on the currency one, just a funny story there. Years and years and years ago, we had a donor who applied, uh, a, a, an NGO in Uganda, who applied to a US donor, and they gave simply the dollar sign as a currency. And it wasn't until the negotiation that we revealed that the donor understood this to be in Ugandan shilling and the NGO in US dollar, because the abbreviation is both US and then D. So let's make sure we are absolutely right about what currency to use. Yes, and also, you know, uh, if anything is unclear, if we have any doubts about what needs to go in the budget in terms of currency rates, ratios, best to identify these questions from day one and ask for clarifications from the donor before we spend, uh, we, we invest our time and efforts into that. Yeah, no, you're so right. You're, you're still right there. Cool. Moving on? Yep. Uh, the contingencies. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll have a look at this. Um, very, very, very simply put, we often see, and we see this, sorry, can you hear me? No, I'm not on mute. Yes. Um, we see a lot of proposals that are submitted to us for review before they go to a donor where the proposal is thought of, it's smart, it, the narrative is, is fantastic. Uh, the contingencies and the what if costs are in there. The ratios work great in the narrative. And then less of that, or sometimes none of that, is reflected in the budget. And maybe that is you know, uh, you know, symptomatic of the fact that the budget is, seems to be always done last, which is something I think I already voted for not doing, start as early as you can. But make sure that there, everything that is in the narrative matches your budget 100%. If there's any mismatch, if there's something in the budget that isn't in the proposal, in the narrative, or there's something in the proposal that isn't in your budget, if there's a mismatch, it will come up in the negotiations. Worst of case, worst case, another budget is just better and the donor goes with that. So these two need to talk to each other. They need to be good. So here are a few different ways of how donors want the information. Some, some donors want all project activities costed. So every individual activity they should be should be costed. Some donors say all costs included should be expressed in general headers, such as human resources, project-related admin. So they are designed by function. That's another way of dealing it. Other donors or other projects just lend themselves to be budgeted per phase. So phase one, going from January till summer, say, is um, cost this. Summer to next winter, cost this, et cetera, et cetera. And lastly, projects, uh, you can budget per objective, which the last point, the last way of budgeting gets ever more popular because it gives the donor or the funder an impression of what they are buying. What do we buy for this objective or this outcome? That can stretch over the five, five, six, three to six years, whatever the project length is. It can involve all your human costs. It can involve your indirect costs or it not. doesn't matter. But these are different ways of how the donor wants the information. And your budget needs to be responsive to that. If the donor doesn't prescribe a way, you need to choose one of these four ways. Now, we're getting into technical area of budgeting techniques. So if you've got any questions on that beyond this, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, refer to slide, what slide number is that, Hande? Um, uh, we are in slide nine. So if your question had, on, on the ways to manage and to structure the budget in your question, please just refer to slide nine. Great. 
and also something to keep in mind to ensure the content of the proposal matches 100% with your budget is the last minute changes. Okay, uh, yeah. Just before submission, a few hours, uh, you might want to change uh, the details of an activity or you might want to update the cost of uh, something. It's very, very vital to make sure that the final version of uh, your uh, technical proposal and financial proposal match each other 100%. Yeah. It happens... Uh, more times than you know i care to uh, imagine it uh, the it the final versions do not match and uh, organize organizations lose points in the um uh, marking of their proposals just because of the last minute mistakes yeah, i completely agree uh, and particularly when you consider that our analysis has clearly shown that the majority of proposals score within a few percentage points of each other. So one or two percentage points loss in the competitive scoring of a proposal is already a lost proposal. So um, along with the other proposal um, related webinars that we do, um, the budget is probably the biggest contributor to a proposal win. Definitely so. And it's already a very competitive uh, yeah. field trying to you know get the funding and uh, losing just because of these small details hurts sure. because um, i'm an so accountant i'm gonna do this one um because uh, this, is, this is getting a little bit um ah, i'm just keen about it there are there are principally two ways of budgeting activity or line by line uh, and the separation is very easy you can search google and you can search the accountancy standards and find you know books written on that but it comes down to this an activity budget separates the program into a group of small activities. So it's either by logical order or by time order, and it's called activity-based costing. So if you go on a holiday, that's where you usually budget on an activity. This is how much we're taking for the flight, or this is how much we're taking for the drive. This is how much money we're spending at the bar or the restaurants. This is how much, so it's an act, you, you're doing your cost by activity. The other way of budgeting, of course, is a line by line budget or a thematic area. So you're doing it by human resource, by stationary, by petrol, by travel, by uh, non-food items, by food items, by whatever. Both are perfectly valid ways of budgeting. The problem is when you mix them and that happens all the time. And that is really, you cannot choose an activity-based budgeting and then go thematically under the activity there because the allocation will be terrible. And my goodness me, please think of the reporting. If you submit a bad budget and then you have to report against that after you've won it, it's gonna be an absolute disaster. I guarantee you, you will make a financial loss and a massive headache and probably a heart attack in the final report. So let's avoid all that by A, sticking to the donor template. And if there is no donor template or if the donor template doesn't give you the um, uh, doesn't mandate a way of activity-based budgeting or line-by-line-based budgeting, then by all means, choose one and stick to it. And that's it on the slide. When, Anything else? when we are working with mostly uh, EU donors, we, um, you know, there's a tendency to use line-by-line uh, line budgets. Yeah. But, uh, for example, UN donors mostly prefer activity budgets, work package budgets. Yeah. So, you know, it's um, at the end of the day, uh, if the donor has a template, it's, you know, based on the preference of the donor funding or, or funding organization. But it's the um, essence of the uh, bu pr budget preparation to make sure that it also makes sense to you internally. Perfect vision, absolutely right. Cool, moving on, we need to hurry up, otherwise we don't get enough time for the questions. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Andrew. Yeah, well, um, in order to start drafting your uh, budget, first of all, there are some key questions that need get to be answered within your organization. To start with, who will be doing the work? Uh, how many people do we need to implement this project? Do we need them full-time? Do we need them half-time, uh, part-time? Is a percentage of work to be allocated? How long is it going to take? Is it a 10-month project? Is it a two-year pro project? 
and how many actual working days do we have uh, within this timeline? And what do we require in terms of supplies and equipment? Are we going to need cars? Are we going to need um, uh, special equipment to implement the uh, activities? And uh, one of the mistakes that are very often made is to budget for uh, cars to be used in the field, but not at any maintenance cost or even fuel costs. Yeah. When you don't add this cost to your budget, the donor does not come back to you and ask whether you need a additional cash, but assumes that it will be your in-kind or you know, uh, organizational uh, support to the implementation of the project. Very true. Um, uh, and, yep. and think about the other related costs as well. Everybody of our of our funding support partners, they think about salaries, but very often staff costs really do not just the, include the salary. The in fact, the salary is the smaller cost. The social insurance, the uh, ethnic insurance, the training, the off time times, the internal travel time, the training time, all that are staff costs. If you don't put them in at the proposal time, you will not get paid for them. Very important. Okay. And they are not an indirect cost, by the way, before we get that question. You can put an, a staff all cost rate in there. It is perfectly admissible. You can negotiate it with the, with the donor, but it is a direct cost of the project as long as that staff member works the majority of the time on the project. Um, going back to the list of questions. <laughs> We did have a few more questions on the previous slide, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, about the uh, questions. Where will the activities take place? Do you need to rent a venue? Do you need a different office? Is there, you know, a, a setup required? Uh, will there be national or international travel within the project? And uh, have you uh, calculated how much it might cost with, you know, some some margin allowed and uh, when you are thinking about travel also of course if it is overnight travel then the per diems and other incidentals should be included as well um, will there be a supervision or oversight included or will your project need to be audited at the end and you need to cover the auditor costs from the project so uh, anything from the first day to the final uh, reporting of the uh, implementation, we need to have the answers of these questions before starting the draft of the budget template. Right. And of course, if they are if the if a cost is not in your budget, surely the donor will not pay for it. Absolutely. The la basically, just to take it back to basics, um, the last thing we want to do is submit a budget and then if we win it and do the project startup, face a lot of costs which we couldn't park in any of the lines of the donor. Mm -hmm. Because even if the donor understands the rationale, they may not be able to approve the costs. That's, that's exactly what we want to avoid. Yes. Okay. Um, should Would I put you it like to? Yeah, fine. So everybody knows the idea of, uh, or most, if you, if you don't, please ask question of direct or indirect cost. Very shortly, direct cost is a cost of an activity or a good or a service you purchase directly related to the project or to, to the program. An indirect cost is some sort of overhead cost. Now, so far so good, it, the devil lies in the detail. Is the time of a country director who oversees five projects a direct cost or an indirect cost? If you've got a strong donor position, I would immediately argue, well, this program, this country director supervises supervises five programs, i.e. 20% of her or his time is uh, related to this project. So it's, I will argue it in the project as a direct cost. That saves my indirect, my ICR cost. That makes my project overall more or better off. 
the donor can always negotiate that down. And frankly, if they like a proposal, if you have a good position, if your capacity statement is well, if your budget is well written, they may negotiate on it, but they're probably compromised on it. But that is my starting point for a strong donor position. And that saves my unrestricted on this idea. Most donors have a policy. Hopefully it's in the TRR, but make sure we adhere to these. Most of you will know this already. The structural, managerial, logistical support that are indirect costs should be as much as possibly um, assigned as a direct cost to the program. So your logistics officer sitting in Berlin, Hamburg, Washington, Geneva, wherever, on a project uh, and complicated procurement for uh, in Kenya, Turkey, or Asia, wherever, should be argued as a direct cost, at least partially so. And again, the donor might negotiate with you, but let's start from the uh, from a budget that has that as a direct cost in order to preserve your unrestricted element. Um, make sure that we categorize them appropriately. Um, these sort of best guesses or these, um, you know, try to just put in a overall contingency will a pretty weak negotiation position. Um, so let's make sure that we. Um, get as much detail down as possible. Here's a tip for some of your overhead costs or some of your back office operation costs, some of your leadership or governance costs. They probably don't change as much as you think. So in January, February, at the beginning of the year, you might just say for every proposal, this is what a director, a trustee, a procurement officer, a training officer, an IT officer costs us per, per month, per person and just attribute that to every proposal written in that year. That's a pretty good way of doing this quickly. You don't have to decide this on every proposal. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on from this. Yep. You wanna go with this? Yep. Uh, well, uh, the guidelines are one of the key tools when you, sorry, microphone. <laughs> the... The guidelines are one of the key tools when you are uh, working on a proposal, whether it be the technical part or the financial part. So uh, they are very helpful in understanding what the donor wants. Um, sorry, we just got a message uh, asking whether we could repeat the last sheet. Numbers, number six is that? Yep, we'll get, let's get back to it after we're done here with this. Yep, okay. Otherwise, we'll massively overrunning. Yep, we, we will forget. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's very important to uh, read the uh, guidelines very, very carefully when we are preparing both uh, types of proposals. And uh, for some of the frequent errors that are made is exceeding the project budget, which means that you know you you blow the whole thing before you even uh, apply. Yeah. Uh, forgetting in which currency you are submitting, is it in US dollars? Is it in euros? Is it in a local currency? And uh, do we need to show conversion rates? You know, uh, these are sometimes uh, small errors that lead to uh, not winning pro uh, proposals. And uh, the indirect cost recovery, which sometimes donors allow and sometimes they do not. So uh, when you read the uh, guidelines for the budget or the financials of the proposal, and you think that it will not be you know, a positive uh, idea to follow these uh, rules, then it might not be the right donor for your organization. And um, simply by reading the uh, guidelines in on day one and asking uh, for clarifications from the donor will uh, help you to avoid some of these mistakes. Chris? Perfect. Uh, no, nothing to add there. Uh, on the last point, I just want to say that uh, most large donors have an indirect cost policy and you need to stick to them. If the, obviously, the definition of what is an indirect cost and what is a direct cost can be negotiated about, and I've just mentioned this, we can be smart about it and therefore preserve our indirect cost recovery rate for actual indirect costs. Um, but once you've made the decision, you can't deviate. 
Um, so if uh, the EU typically pays between seven and 10% in direct cost recovery, if you your organization's overheads are way over this, then they might just not be the right donor for you. So it may not even apply. Having said that, even the EU is getting more flexible. Um, I'm going to do the contingencies if you permit, Hande. I love contingencies. Yes, please go ahead. Um, so contingencies is one of my personal bugbears. Contingencies are the what if costs. What happen? What does it cost if or that happens or if that or this does not happen? Typical contingency is fuel costs. You know, what if, what if we have another something happening and fuel prices rise massively? If you're in a, pro in a humanitarian project, like last week's help uh, a lot of humanitarian donors, uh, don agencies with humanitarian work uh, to Northern Syria and Southern Turkey, then fuel costs are a major item. We don't know what the fuel price will be in three months time. So the way to do it is a specific fuel cost contingency. And after 15 years, I'm yet to see the donor who votes and strikes that down. Same thing with staff recruitment costs or IT pro pro provision costs or inflation protection costs. What donors don't like is this bottom line, this co the so-called catch out, you know, there we are, we're adding 10% in case something goes wrong. Because that seems like a cop out. It's not a very accurate way of calculating a budget. It is sort of just regarded as free money. So if you need a contingency, which in most cases you will need because life is inherently unforecastable, you need to be, uh, you need to be as specific as you can salaries, contingencies for hiring new staff if you've lost staff or if staff got sick or whatever, absent for any reasons. Fuel contingency for fuel. Uh, inflation contingency for uh, foreign exchange losses, um, et cetera, et cetera. All of these, but individually, are easy to argue. They just need to be put in there somewhere. And on that side, every line in your budget must be justifiable. That bottom line approach, 10% for everything, will be very difficult to justify. And even if the donor approves it, it's going to be hugely difficult to report against. Good. That's pretty much the contingency. Hande, anything to add there? Um, I, I can just say that, you know, uh, donors do not like to see lump sums that are not calculated, but just, you know, added there as numbers. Uh, because when they are making this investment, sometimes as a you know grant or sometimes as a credit, they want to know exactly where it's going to be spent. Cool. Oops, I'm moving way too fast here. Sorry. There we are. Number yes, number nine. Sorry. Number yep. Yeah. Over to you, Anne. Uh, yep. Uh, well, it's always helpful to have an extra pair of eyes, uh, especially fresh eyes, to double check, triple check, sometimes you know, check for the tenth time uh, before uh, final submission of the documents. Because uh, someone who has not been involved in the writing uh, process uh, can see mistakes much more easily uh, compared to someone who's been looking at the same numbers and figures for uh, weeks on end. Uh, so uh, make sure to uh, have one of your colleagues available uh, with some time allocated to proofreading both the technical and financial proposals. And uh, the formulas and calculations need to be checked quite you know, carefully on, the, on this process as well. Absolutely. Um, we are amazed how many calculation errors are being submitted. It's absolutely inexcusable. I cannot emphasize enough how, to, uh, how important it is to make sure you meet all the donor requirements, uh, the percentages, the explanations, the justifications in the budget template, because um, missing one of the donor requirements or adding there a budget item that should not be there will uh, cost you all that uh, time and effort you invested in preparing the, uh, uh, the proposal. Um, once again, making sure that your 
uh, technical proposal matches 100% with your financial proposal. So to say that if I do not have your technical proposal at hand, just by looking at your financial proposal, I should be able to uh, quite clearly understand what the project is about, how long it's going to take, why do you need this uh, amount and what you are going to be spending it on. Super. And yep, and numbers, you know, making sure that all the calculations are correct and they match with your narrative proposal. And on the EU, or if you are applying to continental European donors, um, just a small thing. We use Americans and British people and um, continental Europe use the comma and the dot differently. So does Excel. Mm -hmm. It is a source for error if you put in a comma as a thousand separator or a comma or a dot as a thousand separator. Just to make sure I've seen this just this week. Yeah. It, it, it messes up the budget. Yeah. Good. Um, one last time, a good budget, as my, like my colleague just mentioned, um, is a communication tool. Uh, it's absolutely uh, uh, what it says about the program and the organization is more than just the price that is beneath it. A good budget should demonstrate these five things. And I just briefly want to mention them and then wrap it up. It should be open, providing details of the core salaries, the overheads, the infrastructure costs, demonstrating an openness and a transparency to what you do. You're not some sort of black box that charges indiscriminate amounts uh, for a project management. No, you're pretty open about what your people and your infrastructure and your overhead costs. That means you need to be pretty open about it internally in your own organization as well, which uh, is a challenge for some. You want to demonstrate excellent value for money, but you don't want to be the cheapest. Value for money doesn't mean a race to the bottom. It doesn't mean just being the cheapest. In fact, good value for money is rarely ever the cheapest. I can attest to that as well. Critical for donors want to see that they're getting quality work for a good budget. You do not need to just undercut the potential competition. That is no way to win a budget uh, a proposal. A good budget is above all a display of your capacity. A well-prepared budget really demonstrates that you are efficiently able to professionally manage the finances of a program. It is particularly important if you're a small or mid-sized organization and you want to graduate to larger amounts of grants or social contracts or competitive tenders. There you need to show financial management capacity and a good budget shows that. It really wants to show your competitiveness here, making sure that a donor can view the budget next to the other ones and show where you are more competitive or not. Again, competitive doesn't mean cheap. It means, do you bring value to the program at a good value price? And finally, particularly for the governmental donors, extremely important, but for all others as well, compliance. You know, if the budget isn't right, if you can't even get a budget right at the very beginning of the proposal, what chance is there that you get the program right? It just shows a level of uh, uh, compliance capacity that the donor either gets comfort from or discomfort. And if it's the latter, they're likely not want to engage with you. Good. We're right slightly over time, but I think this was worth it. We answered some questions straight away. Thank you very much for signing up to this webinar. We are getting to the questions right now. If you have a question that you don't want to share in a public webinar, then please email Hande or myself. Our email addresses are here. Once again, the training material will be shared with you in a few days by my colleague Deborah, um, the, the slides and the recording link. There's also a ton more tips on the insights part of the Amazon website. Please go and check it out. Um, and on the 22nd of February, we're going to have a more management conversation about leading an NGO through these uncertain times we have right now. Good. And with that all being said, I'm going to stop the sharing of this questions. And we're going to get to the questions, shall we? Question and answers? Yep. Um, Lou, uh, Lou Talbot, thank you very much for asking there uh, 20 minutes ago. You asked, can you tell us about donor attributes to building in crisis modifiers to develop project proposals, uh, project budgets? Andy, do you understand what Lou is trying to ask? 
uh, what uh, donors' perspectives on in terms of uh, building in crisis modifiers to development project budget? Well, um, what, uh, especially with uh, organizations focusing on uh, development projects, uh, it's you know wh whether you are able to uh, add a budget item in terms of crisis response. Uh, it uh, depends very much on the uh, specific donor. Uh, sometimes they have the flexibility to edit budgets during implementation. Sometimes they are much more strict and, you know, uh, do not allow room for that. So, you know, that will very much depend on specific donor, unfortunately. And Lou has also asked, uh, what we mean by line by line on the uh, activity budget. Uh, okay, so I thought we get back to that. Um, thanks very much, Lou. Um, so what I mean with line by line budget is that you you summarize them thematically. So a line by line budget, budget would have a line called human resource costs. Next line, uh, purchase of material costs. Uh, next line, um, office rent or office infrastructure costs. So it doesn't do it by activity like uh, the delivery of non-food items or training of local organization or engagement with the parliamentary group or whatever it is you do, but it summarizes them by function, by line, by line. I hope that helps, Lou, if you, or if anybody else still needs some sort of conceptual understanding of it, uh, please give me a call or just an email uh, and we'll, we'll sort it out. Um, um. Right. One, of, one of the participants has asked uh, for any solutions or good practices to account for the potential variation of the exchange rate between the time of submission and the uh, time of implementation. Well, uh, when you are awarded a contract and uh, before signing the uh, contract, there is a short uh, negotiation period most of the time. So uh, it helps to use that uh, pro time of uh, period of time to uh, refer to issues like such as this, and then you might be able to revisit the budget to, to amend the currencies and the total amount. Great. Let me pick up another question that we just had. Dr. Nizar asks, can we change a budget after the agreement signature? I think that's a great question. Thank you very much, Dr. Nizar. Yes, you can to a degree. Um, so with most donors, not all, I'm just saying with most, um, you can, for example, um, not change the total amount of your category of budget, but change uh, the expenses from within that category. So, for example, if you have a, uh, I'll give you a live example of an education program. If you had a education activity budget which says funding the school in that particular location for one year, that is one big activity, costs say I don't know, seven hundred thousand euros, for example, and within that seven hundred thousand euros, you had two hundred and fifty euros assigned to a teacher and 100,000 assigned to an assistant teacher. And now it turns out that you can get the assistant teacher, you can get more assistant teachers than actually qualified teachers. So you're, gonna buy, you're going to hire two assistant teachers and less teachers. Then within that category, you are permitted with most donor rules, for example, including the EU, uh, to change the allocation. So you're moving budget from teachers to assistant teacher. Same with from fuel to to say delivery, to logistics delivery or something like that. So you're not transporting yourself, but you're sending it via a, um, a company. So that you can do. Now, most donors also allow up to 10% budget allocation between the various activities or phases, if you have a phase budget. So if it's not above 10%, then you just need to inform the donor of it. That's nice practice anyway, frankly, but you do not need their legal consent. And by the way, I wouldn't ask for legal consent. Very important. If you have a legal right to allocate 10% to something different, do it. It's an FYI, dear donor. I am doing this. I'm not asking for your permission. You have that right with most institutional donors. Check yours in Pacific. What you cannot do is 
move budget to another project. Obviously. Dr. Nisa, I hope that answers your question. Um, I see that in the Q&A, Sarah uh, did not hear uh, which organization has now become more flexible, and uh, it was USAID. Yeah. <laughs> USAID is uh, even though they are getting a bit more flexible in the uh, templates and budgets. And um, also uh, with regards to Sarah's question on the uh, European Commission, where they, uh, we advise to do a detailed budget for a concept note, even though only the total amount is requested. Um, not, not to do a detailed budget for a concept note, but to have your main items ready so that uh, 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 most of the time when uh, the, uh, within the time limit between the concept note submission and the full technical proposal submission, you are allowed up to 10% change uh, from the uh, amount you indicated at the beginning uh, to the uh, real budget. So uh, if you have a very, very uh, good idea of what budget items we will need and around how much this is going, this is going to cost to you, and if you can uh, put it in the concept note as a text explaining that you have a good understanding of what kind of uh, budget items you are looking at, that would be helpful uh, simply to show that you have done your homework. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Nizar, you've also just asked the question, uh, what do I do if the expense uh, has become uh, raised for a global problem like an earthquake or war? Uh, you have an ongoing project, Dr. Nizar, you do have the right to, um, if an ongoing project becomes unviable, impossible to implement with the current budget due to a shock event like an earthquake, like conflict, or like anything else, even in massive inflation could be a shock event, then you have a right to stop the project. Obviously, you don't want that. You also have a right to ask for a no-cost extension if, it's just, if you just need more time. Or finally, you could ask, but it's subject to approval, for an increase in the budget. Now, the donor doesn't want its money back. The donor wants the project to succeed. Um, so if you present it and pack it well, the likelihood that they agree to a reasonable request in the change in the budget or the time is quite high. I guess it always says, you know, how you how you respond is how you um, get the answer out. Um, can you see anything we have not touched on? Yes, um, Sarah Peters, you asked here yeah, on the European Commission. Do you advise to do a detailed budget for on the concept? Oh, I, I answered that. Oh, sorry. Okay, fine. Sorry, yeah. I was looking at the other questions whilst you answering that. Good teamwork here. Um, <laughs> We've done that. Uh, Damian, you've just asked how often do activities have labor included? It completely depends on your project. If your project needs labor included in all activities, then labor should be included in the budget on all activities. In fact, it'd be weird if it isn't. Um, but you may have activities that are completely done by technology or that are not labor intensive. So in which case, it probably wouldn't. Um, again, if you've got any more questions on that then you know email me uh, we can always schedule a one-to-one -one. and this i'm not going to send you a bill for that um i think that's all on the q and a, q and a uh, box have we exhausted the group i mean we are st we're still a lot of people in this webinar we are talking about finance and accounting by a german and uh, i mean that's that's pretty geeky here um, Stella just uh, typed her question. Uh, after getting support from the donor and we realized during activities that we missed to ask for fuel, for example, what can we do? Well, uh, unfortunately, you will either have to find some other funding for it or you know, spend it from the organization's budget because um, as, as I explained during uh, the uh, slides, if you did not put it there when you were uh, already budgeting for the uh, vehicle, then the donor guest assumed uh, that you had it covered. 
So uh, unless you have a very, you know, a flexible donor who uh, will, you know, be open to mending the budget, uh, then there will need to be a different solution of funding the fuel or other relevant maintenance ex expenses. Absolutely. Um, Eric was asking whether we could go back to the first slide. Yeah, I've just looked at the first the talking points. I presume um, he means the, the donor requirements, how to meet them, and the value of a good budget. Um, we did discuss donor requirements throughout this webinar, and obviously the value on the on the first and the last few slides, Gerard. But if you do uh, have a question in there, then I would because we're running out of time. We've got two minutes left now. Uh, I again invite you to sort of email us, uh, email me, and we'll get to a answer to you. If you've got a specific question on either of these two points or in fact anything else and we have one last question shall we do it and there's yep. one anonymous attendee who asked any indirect core cost recovery tips what indirect cost percentage would you suggest if allowed to put your own <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> that's a great question i'd love to hear who asked that question um so the Oh, gosh, here in the last two minutes, the, the, the big signs of indirect costs. Indirect costs range from 5 to 50%. Uh, it, the range is even bigger than what you've mentioned in your question, 7 to 25%. Some donors, like the US, have a NICRA rate for some or for most of their regular implementers. So you stick to that percentage. So every few years, you've been given an indirect cost recovery rate that is donor-specific for US AID. Um, and it might be, we've seen rates ranging from 12 to 35, 37%, depending on what you do, where you do it, how much indirect cost is viable or what is not. Uh, uh, for humanitarian, usually, usually less. For you know, political advocacy, law change, gender work, it's usually higher, or media work is usually higher. Um, the other thing is the um, uh, what to put down. Uh, again, your competitiveness is, is, is important. Your value for money is as well important. But your indirect cost rates are not the only ones which direct that. You know, bear in mind that just because you have an indirect cost rate of only 5%, that doesn't automatically make you more competitive or better value for money. You have to demonstrate why yours is so low. We recommend that viably a donor an implementation agency needs around about 30% unrestricted funding in total of the funding portfolio. So if your donor proposal includes only 20 or only 10% unrestricted funding as an indirect cost to this one, you need to think strategically where do the other percentage come from because most organizations need more than just 7%. Um, really would love to discuss this more in detail with you. Please reach out. We are a bit of running out of time. But we have one more question from Adina. I'd like to get down to it before we shut it off. Uh, how can we forecast contingency costs, for instance, fuel or HR, HR costs? Are there any particular website that we should refer to if it varies? No, Adina, there isn't a particular website. You need to come up with a reasonable, defendable, justifiable um, rationale. So if you are, as part of your project, for example, I'm using your fuel cost question, if you drive around a lot as part of your project and you're in an area that has a lot of conflict, we all know as economists that fuel goes up and down were as uh, uh, the more conflict apps and flows. So you might want to put down a strong rationale saying uh, we need up to X percent fuel cost contingency because we live in a uh, very, because over the last three years, fuel costs have uh, varied by up to X percent. If you live in an area, for example, where salaries are fluctuating massively um, by up to 10 to 20 percent even, then a 10 to 20% contingency, or maybe use the middle, 15% contingency on salaries only is not unreasonable. That's, that's, that, that's possible works. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone who joined, uh, we will be sharing the slides. So yes. you, you should be receiving them in your emails in two days, maximum three days. So um, if you, you know, if you have any other questions that you will not be able to uh, share during this period, do feel free to contact us by email. 
Fantastic. And I wish you all the best of health and hopefully some happiness as well. Um, uh, uh, bear in mind that a budget is just a communication tool at the end of the day. We need to explain it well. Um, and I hope that you took some pointers away from this conversation. Um, and if you got any more questions, we, we can only glance at a very high level here only. We can't advise specific on specific donors. By all means, please um, let us know. We, we, we are here to help NGOs. We're here to make them stronger. And thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye.